The holidays can do it. The holidays can bring out the worst of us and sometimes the best of us. And uh, when the worst of us comes out, we can hurt people we love and uh, we don't want to do that. It could be financial. It could be that dysfunctional relative that comes over. <laughs> it just happens. We get stressed. And uh, this could be a one-off thing or it could be something pervasive going on in the relationship that might need to be addressed. That's why I created the Healed Being program over at HealedBeing.com. Maybe it's a normal relationship issue or maybe someone continues to do behaviors that hurt the other person. And that's how I help. I help the emotionally abusive person change. Head over to HealedBeing.com if that sounds like something you want to check out. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to the Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Hello, this is Paul Coliani, and I want to help you learn the skills you need to deal with life's challenges using emotional intelligence and critical thinking without compromising who you are. This show consists of my personal opinions and is meant for informational purposes only. Always seek a professional for your mental health and well-being. Welcome to the show. Been doing this a good nine years now. I just realized that. <laughs> nine years I've been here. And um, I heard from somebody the other day that said, I've been listening to your show since 2013. Wow, the show has gone through its transformations, just like I hope anyone that's been listening a while has gone through any type of transformation and hopefully a positive one. Sometimes the negative ones are good too. I've gone through negative transformations where uh, I got worse. <laughs> I got worse mentally, emotionally over the years. And I don't mean just getting sad or angry. Just mean my behaviors. Like at the beginning of this episode, I talked about healed being. I went through some transformations in my life because I took these old coping mechanisms and survival mechanisms from childhood, brought them into my adult relationships, and I expected everything to work out perfectly. Everything is going to be smooth because I know how life works. And, uh, well, I believed I knew how life worked, and that's why I ruined so many relationships, so many good romantic relationships. I even ruined friendships too, because I was a people pleaser and I just let people take advantage of me and they didn't even know they were doing it. I just allowed it to happen and I didn't understand what was happening. I just thought, why can't they see that I'm frustrated or annoyed? Why can't they see that I really meant no when I said yes? What obvious signs do I have to show them? I've got my hand on the back of my neck and I'm saying, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll help. No problem. Can't they read my mind? Can't they see my body language? Can't they hear the inflection in my voice? Can't they get the message that I really don't want to do it? And then because they're a good friend or someone I love, my family, whoever, because they know me so well, they should be able to figure this stuff out. They should be able to look at me or hear me and tell that I really don't want to do something or I'm really not being congruent, meaning my words don't match my body language or my intentions seem to be different than what I'm saying. So why can't they see that and say, it doesn't really look like you want to do this. Some people have. Some people have that acute observation ability. And a lot of people don't because, you know, they're just doing their thing and they trust the person they're with to tell them the truth. This is something I learned that, that I wasn't honest. If I really meant no, I should have said no. If I meant yes, I should have said yes. And so I spent most of my life not telling the truth. And then I blamed others for it. I didn't uh, verbally blame them. I didn't actually say, hey, it's your fault and you did this. I just put it in the back of my mind. I filed it. I'm thinking, well, what a jerk. Why would they put me through that when they know 
I'm not really interested in doing that, or that sounds like a terrible thing, and I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. So why can't they get it? And that's what I would put in my my internal filing cabinet. I didn't want to do something, or I did want to do something, but I wouldn't be honest about it. And this was even worse in romantic relationships. And when you do it in a romantic relationship, what ends up happening is that the other person just... Uh, sees it as uh, what you're saying at face value and takes it at face value because they trust you and they love you and they want you to be happy and they assume that you're going to tell them what you really think and feel. And so we get ourselves into trouble sometimes when we go the people pleaser route and say something that we believe they want to hear or do something that we believe they want to see us do. And that can be exhausting. (laughs) That can burn you out. And so my path out of that was taking risks. And those risks were just basically being confrontational to me. To me, it was confrontational to disagree with someone. Even though that's not really a confrontation, it's just honoring yourself. And I had to make that clear distinction. I had to remember that I'm honoring myself I'm not doing it against them. I'm doing it for me. And I had to learn that people who love me will support me doing something for me. People who don't love me or have an ulterior motive, they're selfish, they want, they want to control me, or they want me to do what they want me to do, and they'll be unhappy if I don't, those people may not be good for me. Those people may have other plans for me. And because I've been so accommodating a lot of my life or most of my life, them having me in their life was very useful to them. So I might have shown signs of frustration and anger, passive aggressiveness, and they didn't necessarily read that as me saying uh, no or me honoring my boundaries. They read it as, I don't know what's going on with him, but uh, I still need your help, so let's do this. (laughs) They wouldn't actually dive in to what's going on with me. They just needed me for something. And again, do I blame them? No, because I didn't say no. And I didn't say yes. (laughs) I didn't mean what I say and say what I mean. I was used to saying what I believed they wanted me to say. And so the risks I started taking, which what I would call uh, emotional leaps of faith, because I was putting my emotions in danger because I didn't know how to handle uh, disagreement. I didn't know how to handle conflict, so I would avoid it. And um, I just assumed that there would be conflict when I started uh, honoring myself. So my risk, like one of my first risks was at work when I was working in late 2000s, I finally said something to my boss that uh, I normally wouldn't have said. And it was an honoring of myself, even though when I did it at the time, I felt like it was against him. And I had to start making that distinction. The distinction is important. You have to remember, and I mean, you don't have to, but please remember, it's important to Remember that your uh, honoring of yourself is different than doing something against someone else. They're completely two different things. You honoring yourself is different than being confrontational. You honoring yourself is different than creating a conflict or strife in a situation or any type of relationship. It's completely different. Somebody might say, yeah, but what if honoring myself is telling them off? (laughs) That could be seen as a defensive or protective move. Yes. I'm going to tell you off because I want you to get away from me. That's sort of honoring yourself, but now we have maybe a little bit of a mix. Because telling someone off is pointing the finger at them, wanting them to do something different. You want them to change. But honoring yourself 
is pointing the finger at, at yourself and asking, what do I want and what am I going to do about it? Now, what you do about it might be uh, telling them, please don't say or do that to me anymore. That might be a way to honor yourself. So in a way, you are pointing the finger at them, but only because they're the cause of something that you want to stop. Like if a rock was rolling down a hill towards you, you can't point at the rock and tell it to stop. It's going to continue and it's going to head right at you. If you don't move, it might hit you. But a person is different. A person replies and responds, hopefully, and they will either do it or not. But this is where I believe it's a wonderful gift you give to someone when you honor yourself and you ask them to uh, do something or not do something in honor of you. This is a gift to them. And that gift is an opportunity for them to empower themselves or do an empowering behavior to show you that they care about you and to show you that they are also capable of making decisions that are in your best interest and aren't necessarily trying to be, uh, or they're not trying to be harmful towards you. They're not trying to hurt you. It's a gift that you give to someone when you say, would you please not do that again? That's a gift. How, I mean, there's no other way to look at that. Would you please not do that again? If you said that to me, then I would take the opportunity to say, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. And I won't do that again. That is a gift that you gave to me so that I don't cross your line or cross your boundary again. I'm going to accept that gift and love that gift because if you didn't tell me what would happen, I would cross your line again. Very likely I would cross your boundary maybe multiple times after that. So if you never tell me, I have no idea that I'm crossing your line. But then there are people that might say, yeah, but Paul, what about the body language? Well, yeah, I might be able to read that, of course. But a lot of people aren't in that space. They aren't looking for that stuff. They're just in their own world or they're just interacting and not thinking along those lines. They're not thinking about body language and voice inflection and things like that. I look for that stuff, but a lot of people don't. They're just in their own space. They're just enjoying the moment and they're not analyzing every moment. They're not analyzing people like that. So those clues might be missed. For example, if I said, hey, would you mind helping me move this couch up three flights of stairs and you have a bad back or you can't lift it or you don't want to and you said, oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I guess I will. I might see that or hear that and go, look, it looks like you don't really want to do that. And if you said, no, 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 I really do want to do it. Uh, I, I want to help you. Then I might tend to believe you. But if I still notice something like uh, an eye roll <laughs> or you holding your back before we start, I'm going to say, no, 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 let's not do this. I can tell you're not, you're not really serious. You don't really want to help or you can't help. Now, that might be me infringing on your ability to say yes or no. And you might say, don't you trust me? I gave you the answer. Don't you trust me? And I might say, okay, if you're serious, let's do it. That's the point where I will trust someone when I give them that chance to say, this is your moment to say yes or no. But uh, absolutely, I, I won't know if I'm crossing your line unless you tell me. So I might just ask you again, hey, you helped me move that couch last week. Let's move another one. <laughs> and uh, you might say, uh, okay. Or hopefully you'll say, boy, that really put me out. I was down and out for three days. I couldn't go to work and uh, I can't move another couch. And then I'd feel really bad. And then I'd ask, why didn't you tell me in the first place? So you know, I'm, I'm putting you in this position. It may not be you at all. But my point is, when you tell the person that you're dealing with or whoever you're talking to that you have a boundary, you want to honor that boundary and you are asking them to help you honor that boundary or at least honor your honoring of your own boundaries, then what you're doing is giving them the gift of how you want to be treated. And 
Again, that is a wonderful, that is a golden gift you can give to someone. If you know how I want to be treated, that is a beautiful thing. That is something that if, uh, if you know it, then every time you show up, it's going to be pleasant for me. It's going to be uh, enjoyable. I'm going to have a good time with you because you have learned how I wish to be treated. Now, sometimes friendships or family don't need to have this conversation or go into anything like this too deeply. It's just something that everyone knows. I mean, it's just a common courtesy, common knowledge that you treat people the way you want to be treated or you treat them with respect and kindness and that's how it works. You just keep doing what you're doing and nobody has any issues with it. But what about dysfunctional people? What about the toxic people? What about the people who just don't get it? Like um, my girlfriend told me an ex example when we first moved in together. She said, I was so upset for weeks. I was so, and she tells the story to other people too. <laughs> I was so upset for weeks because he just wasn't helping me in this area. It might have been finances. I think um, we had an arrangement or an agreement that I believed we had. And uh, she didn't get um, what I got. And so what ended up happening is that she was getting more and more frustrated that I wasn't uh, contributing in certain areas. And I didn't even know. I didn't even know she needed help there. Now, she did uh, uh, express stress about those areas and got frustrated about those areas. But... I just assumed she'd ask. <laughs> I just assumed she'd ask if she needed my help. I just thought she's venting and this is good and I'm here to be her shoulder. But she never asked and she got angrier at me and she got frustrated and she didn't know what to do and she thought maybe I was a deadbeat. I mean, I'm giving you some personal stuff here, but this is what happened. And uh, what ended up happening is one day she walked in and I said, look, there's something going on here. You, you seem frustrated or you don't even look at me. You don't even look at me in the eyes. We don't even kiss a lot. And suddenly I feel like this relationship's changing. What's going on? You know, what are you, what's on your mind? And she said, well, nothing. <laughs> I said, yes, there's something on your mind. What is it? And she says, well, I don't want to say. And I said, why not? She goes, well, I don't want you to be upset. And I said, you know what? I would rather you upset me than have to go another day with you ignoring me and neglecting me. Just tell me what's on your mind. And she said, I, I, <laughs> she was uh, hesitating. And, and I said, just be angry if you need to be angry. Just yell at me if you need to yell at me. I, w I want you to do something other than what you've been doing because what's been going on is just, it's not working. It feels like we're not in a relationship. It, it feels like we're just barely existing together. And uh, she finally said, okay, um, I'll tell you, but I think you're going to be upset. And she told me, she said, you know, I, I need help with the finances in this area. And I said, this is what that's about. <laughs> okay, I can help. I will do that. Absolutely. And I could see she just suddenly relaxed and she didn't look stressed anymore. And she looked at me. And she said, oh, uh, thank you. That would be great. And I said, why didn't you tell me this sooner? And she said, I just didn't want to create waves. I didn't want to upset you. I, I thought we could at least get along, but you know, I didn't have to introduce this as another uh, conflict or something. I forget what the words were, but I said, no, please, if you're upset with something, let me know. I, I want to be no I want to be told. I don't want it under the covers or under the radar. I want it out in the open. I want it on the table. Bring it to the table. It's so much easier to work with something than nothing. And she said, okay. <laughs> so next time, I think I told her this, next time you have something on your mind, don't hold back. Just be angry at me if you have to be angry with me. Just bring it out. Put it in the, put it in the air and we'll see where it lands. And so uh, she said, okay, uh, I'm just warning you, <laughs> it's going to happen. And I said, great, because I'd rather have a connection most of the time than no connection and uh, you holding something back. And that's why we have no connection. So 
Uh, next time it did happen, I don't know, several months later, something that she was upset about or frustrated or angry at me. I don't know what it was. I, I don't even remember now. But um, I could tell something was on her mind. And she she did take the step to say, you said that I could share anything with you, right? And I said, yeah, absolutely. What's on your mind? And she said, okay, well, remember how you said that I could share it and you might be upset and that's okay. And I said, yes, 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 tell me. And so she told me, and again, I had this reaction like, that's what this was about. You know, you've kind of been absent and again, you haven't been looking at me and this was on your mind. Okay, I, I definitely, let's work this out. Let's figure it out. And after both instances, we got along right away. We, we connected again and all was well after weeks on the first time. And um, it was just a different environment after that. It was night and day. And so this is what our relationship has developed into is being able to share things, put them on the table, talk about them, allow them to exist, make it make the thing tangible so that we have something to discuss. And this has been the way things are ever since. It has been difficult at times because some things are harder to discuss than others. But again, it is so wonderful to just put it out there and reach some sort of closure and put it out in the open, even at the risk that it could cause a problem uh, to the point where it might feel like we might have to break up over this. Now, we haven't reached anything like that at all, but it feels like that sometimes. It feels like if I tell you this, you're going to be angry with me and you'll want to break up with me. That's been my thought in every other relationship, which is why I started talking about, you know, the people pleaser in the relationship, trying to accommodate the person that you're with by saying what you think they want to hear or doing what you think they want you to do. This is what causes problems is that we hide stuff from people we care about because we think it's going to be too confrontational and they will be upset by it. But every single time this, I can, I can tell you without a doubt, every single time I hide or repress something, it always turns into a mess. <laughs> it turns into such a big, emotionally destructive mess. And uh, it, it ruined, like I said, it ruined my relationships. All my romantic relationships failed because I was never honest. Now, I was honest about all the important things. Well, let me rephrase that. I was honest about all the things I thought were important. But I wasn't honest when I got angry. If I didn't want to let them know I was angry. So I would hold back. And so they never saw the real me. And if you don't show someone the real you, what do they have to work with? They have an interpretation. They have a misrepresentation of you. And when somebody doesn't see the real you, and I'm talking about any type of relationship, work, uh, romantic relationships, family, friendships, if they don't see the real you, they have to make a representation of you in their mind. And a lot of that is open to interpretation. And that's a big problem because if their interpretation of you uh, has any type of embellishment or exaggeration that doesn't exist or is not true, what ends up happening is a lot of expectations aren't met. Even if they think something worse of you or better of you, the expectation is there that this is how you'll show up. But because you might be a person that hides a truth or represses an emotion about something going on, they will have to interpret what's going on with you. And a good example of this is when I used to do the silent treatment. I would withdraw love, withdraw affection, and make the person I'm with feel really bad and unloved and unworthy of love. And it's a, it's a terrible, terrible thing to do with a person that is uh, looking for connection and believes that you love them. And when you pull that away, it makes them feel worthless. It makes them feel unlovable. It will often lead to uh, losing their passion or becoming depressed or at least confused. This happens in a lot of relationships. The silent treatment is like the ultimate form of repression. 
It's the ultimate form of hiding what you really feel to be true or what you know to be true inside of you because you don't want to confront. It's not the only form, but it's, it's up there. And if you hide stuff that you don't want to share and instead you go silent and they can't tell where you are and you do it for the purpose of um, making them feel bad, that's emotionally abusive. That's a, a hurtful behavior to do to someone else because it makes them think they're at fault. It makes them think they did something wrong. And it especially makes them think that they're so awful to you that you don't love them or you don't care about them. I talk about two different silent treatments, but that's one of them. One of them is the emotionally abusive type where you are withholding on purpose to make them feel bad or teach them a lesson, make them rethink you know, what they're doing. It has to do with wanting them to change or feel a certain way. The other type of silent treatment is pretty healthy. You learn something and you realize, oh, gee, I got to process this. That's a lot to take in. I need some time. I need time to process this. There's no intention to hurt the other person. You just need time to process what you just learned. Like I had to process something my girlfriend told me about uh, two years ago. Like, whoa, uh, wow, I need some time to process this. And I just went silent. And all that meant was I just went to another room. <laughs> I just went silent in another room. And I thought about it and I reflected on it and I did the work. I think when you need time to process and reflect, it means you need time to do some work on yourself. Now, what does that mean? That just means thinking about what you just learned or what you just figured out, or maybe you were emotionally triggered and you need to figure things out, reflect on it and find some closure on it. And closure just might mean, how am I going to process this? What am I going to do with this information? Am I okay with this information? Am I not okay with this information? You get to the point where you make your next decision. For example, if you found something out that you just couldn't accept, now you have another decision to make. I can't accept this. So I'm going to take what I know, take what I've learned and put it on the table and talk about it with this person. That could be a difficult step. That could be a difficult position to take. But uh, that might be what you need to do because putting it on the table puts it out there so it can be discussed and angles can be discussed. Like, let's look at it this way. Let's look at it this way. And uh, maybe a resolution. You can come to a resolution or maybe not. Doesn't mean you always find closure, but you work on this stuff and on and on. You just talk about it if you can. And if you can't, if you can't talk about it because it's just so painful, well, this is where we might uh, start holding things in. And just like I started talking about, you might start repressing this stuff. And when you repress this stuff, how do you show up in life? How do you show up the next day and talk to this person and the next week and the next year? And how long do you hold on to it? My girlfriend and I were talking about uh, denial yesterday and how dangerous it can be and also how helpful it can be. I think denial is helpful when used appropriately because it can help you compartmentalize. But it shouldn't be used to uh, stop yourself from working on something that is eating away at you. A good example of denial is my mom denying that uh, she needed to leave my stepfather, my abusive alcoholic stepfather, uh, for 40 years. She's just kind of in denial that uh, things were bad in the relationship. So she just continued moving on. It was helpful in one way if she was never going to leave, which that was the case. She never was going to leave. He ended up leaving her eventually, uh, 40 years, but eventually. It was helpful for her to get through each and every day. But it was unhelpful for her because she never talked about it. And as soon as she started talking about how miserable she was in the relationship, she would, um, she would get so emotional that she would change the subject. And that would go right back to where she was. Okay, I'm just going to compartmentalize this and start living my life again, or at least continue living my life in a way that makes me feel somewhat happy. And so she, very, she got very good at compartmentalizing 
and being in denial because she believed she had no other choice. And she didn't want to risk it. And this is coming back to that leap of faith I was talking about. You kind of have to have a leap of faith and risk yourself, risk your emotional state, risk your uh, comfort. Like you can become comfortable being uncomfortable. And it's a risk to share something that's true with somebody else with, you know, in certain circumstances. It's a risk to be confrontational. It's a risk to honor yourself. It's all a risk because what ends up happening is you find out who the other person really is. Who is this person? You're going to find out. That's the scary part because most of the time we don't want to find out. Now, if we're the type of person that's not honest and not upfront and not just speaking what's on our mind, we're going to find out who that person is. And uh, this can be a great test. It's a scary test sometimes, but it can be a great test. Hey, this is what I have on my mind, and I'm going to share it with you, even though I believe it's going to upset you. How they respond is going to be everything you need to know what kind of relationship you have with this person and who they are and how they want you to feel and if they want you to be happy or not. Is it about them wanting to change or control you? Or is it about them wanting you to enjoy life and be satisfied with your decisions in life and be happy and move along your own pace on your own path? I think that's a healthy way to look at it. I let you move on your own path like you let me move on my own path. And suddenly we're holding hands going down the same path because we love the support in this relationship. We love to support each other. And we love to see each other happy. And if we can do this with each other, we will end up on the same path most of the time because we love to be with people who support us. And we love to stay connected to people who support us. So if we're not with them, at least we, we stay connected. So uh, coming back to taking a risk, like my mom may have felt like she was in danger if she took a risk and shared what was truly on her mind with my stepfather or she may have felt in danger if she chose to take the steps that she wanted to take leaving the relationship she may have felt like doing that would lead to something even worse because she was comfortable being uncomfortable in the relationship she was in but what is it like not being in that relationship she had no idea she just had fear and that's all she could, she couldn't see past the fear. That's all she could see was there was, there was fear beyond that choice of leaving. If I make this choice, there's true fear. And so she chose to, to, to stay with the fear that she knew and the uncomfortable feelings that she knew without taking a risk. And if you've been listening a while, you've heard me talk about the risks that I've taken, at least risks to me. Somebody else might hear the stuff I've done and say, that's not risky at all. <laughs> but to me, I thought I was going to get fired. I thought I was going to get punched in the face. I thought I was going to get, uh, a, a, I was going to destroy a relationship. I thought I was, all kinds of things were going to happen when I took risks of honoring myself by speaking what was on my mind. But every single time I spoke what, what was on my mind, my life improved. So it was risky emotionally. And even physically, to me, that's what it felt like. It was a huge risk. But every time I stood up for myself, every time I honored myself, I learned that the risk paid off in a good way. Now, that doesn't mean it's always going to happen. I may take a risk one day and, you know, I, I, could, I could get hurt. I could get really hurt. But I decided a long time ago that uh, it's worth it. Now, this doesn't mean I'm telling you to do this. I'm, I'm not telling you that you need to take risks, but I am telling you, if you spend your life not showing up as who you want to be and how you want to be, and you're always accommodating others, or you do that a lot, and you avoid conflict, that you will probably never really get what you want in life. You will probably be just under the point of finding comfort and peace and satisfaction or happiness or whatever you're seeking in your life. If you're afraid 
to uh, bring up stress or conflict or strife, you may not get what you want in life. And when you don't get what you want in your life, are, are you happy? The answer could be yes. <laughs> you could be happy. You could be happy just under that point of not getting what you want. Like it's enough where you are, but you can't get what you want. Um, and if it's because you're not standing up for yourself or honoring yourself or saying what you really want to say and you're okay with it, like if you can be okay with that, then more power to you. I'm not here to talk you out of that. If your results are good enough, sometimes that's good enough. I've had to deal with that myself. Sometimes good enough is good enough. Like uh, certain relationships in my life, sometimes those are going to be, they're going to have to be good enough because I can't improve them in any way. There might be a relationship I want to keep, but I can't improve it. Or there might be something that I want to do, but I, I can't do it. I'm getting older. <laughs> so it's going to have to be good enough. I used to uh, rollerblade, like inline skate. You know, I used to do that for years. Doing that now, I risk my uh, hip fractures. <laughs> I'm only 52, but that's kind of on my mind as I get older. Do I really want to risk it? Do I want to do something else and just realize that I can't do what I really want, but this will probably have to do for now, or this is all I can do. And that leads to our acceptance of what life hands us. We have to get to a point that uh, we either accept it or we reject it. This is something I've talked about many times. We either accept and you know stay, stay with the course, or reject it and stay with the course and then complain about it. <laughs> or accept it and not stay with the course and say, you know what, I don't want anything to do with it. Or reject it and not stay with the course and say, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to pivot course here and I'm going to do something different. I am moving in a different direction. That is my um, four choices, really. You can accept and stay, accept and leave, reject and stay, reject and leave. If I accept and stay, I, I can't complain about it anymore because I've accepted it. I mean, I can complain about it, but that's my own fault because I've accepted it. I've chosen to accept it. So if my girlfriend started smoking and I didn't want her to smoke, but I said, you know, okay, I'm not going to complain about it because I still love her. Um, then I'm just going to accept that she smokes and that that's never going to change. I hope it does, but it's never going to change. And that's how I accept things. I just tell myself that will never, ever change. And then uh, she smokes and I can't complain because I've chosen to accept it. And I can't give her a hard time because I told her I, I accept you for who you are and I love you and I just will be over there when you smoke. So that might be what happens. I don't think that'll ever happen, but that's a good example. Somebody does something that you don't like. Are you going to accept it? Are you going to reject it? And if you accept it, are you going to be okay with it and just not complain and be okay as things happen? And you may not like it, but you've accepted it. So you stay and continue the course. Or this is the problem is that we sometimes say, okay, that's fine. You can do what you want, but then you still get angry. Now this is kind of rejecting and staying. I'm rejecting what you're doing and I'm going to stay and continue to give you a hard time about it and give me a hard time about it because I'm exposing myself to what you're doing and that hurts me. So like I said, this is the four choices. And I can probably put anything to the test with these four choices. Any challenge you have, accept and stay, accept and leave, reject and stay, reject and leave. Any challenge you have, just challenge yourself with those four questions or four choices and see what comes up for you. Because I guarantee you, or at least I'm going to 99% guarantee anyone that says I reject it and I stay you're probably not happy. And uh, that is because of a choice you're making, or maybe you feel like you have no choice, but you stay in a situation that you reject. And um, when you do that, you are basically walking back into the fire 
over and over again. That place is on fire. I've walked out, but I got to go back in because I refuse to let that fire stop me. Even though I know it hurts me and it burns me and it, it's painful, I refuse to let it stop me because I want it to change. I want that fire to go out. So I want to continue going in there and continue exposing myself to it. It's a metaphor, but you know what I mean. But let me circle back to what we started talking about, which is when you honor yourself, you're doing it for you, not against them. And when you honor yourself for you, people who love you, people who support you, will love that you're doing that for you. If you've heard this message before on this show, it's because I like to repeat very important philosophies to live by. And I think that's one of them. Standing up for yourself is for you, not against them. And honoring yourself is for you, not against anyone else. And when you honor yourself, people who love you and support you want you to be happy. So they want you to honor yourself and they will even help you. I want to honor myself by doing this. I will help you do that because I want you to be happy. I'm going to protect myself from this person or this thing. I want that too. I want you to feel safe. So I will help you feel safe. Yes, I'm kind of referencing in an indirect way uh, relationships where somebody doesn't feel safe in the relationship, especially with a romantic relationship where they don't feel safe with their partner. If you don't feel safe with somebody in your life, what does that mean? Can you look at the situation, your relationship and say, I don't feel safe because when I say something that's on my mind, my, I speak my truth, it's because I am not allowed to do that. I don't feel safe doing that because if I do, it's not supported. There might be a disagreement that leads to a conflict that leads to me uh, repressing some emotions and repressing some thoughts and I can't be myself because that person makes it very difficult for me to be myself. This is one of the keys to a good, healthy relationship. Every happy, healthy relationship that I've ever seen, they all contain this one component. They contain many components, but they all contain at least this one component, and that is each person supports the other person's individuality. Period. That's it. They support their individuality. That means if I disagree with something my girlfriend is doing, I still support it because she wants to do that. I mean, if she wants to do it, but that's the point. If she wants to do something that I don't want her to do, that's on me. I, I, you know, if I don't want her to do it, I have to become more accepting or I can reject it. <laughs> I can reject it and leave, or I can reject it and stay and complain about it, or I can accept her for who she is and the decisions she's making, even if I disagree with her because I love her. And that is how I show my love. And so I see this component in almost all healthy relationships is that both people support the other person's independence, their autonomy, their choices. They support them. Now, it doesn't mean you support everything 100% all the time. Hey, I'm going to go drive this car off a cliff. No, you don't necessarily support things that might be just a little bit outrageous, but you have this general philosophy in the relationship. I support your happiness. I support the choices that you want to make for yourself. That doesn't mean I agree with them. It doesn't mean, I mean, this can go even deeper. It doesn't even mean that I'll stay with you if you do these things. I'm not saying that as a threat. I'm saying that if they do something or they want to do something that is totally against my values or totally violating my boundaries, it doesn't mean I have to stay in that situation because they want to do it. Now, I'll support them doing it. And this is a little controversial. But yes, if my girlfriend wanted to start doing drugs and smoking crack and all the stuff that might hurt my feelings <laughs> because the relationship would be affected, if she wanted to do, to do all that stuff, I would definitely have a conversation with her and ask her, please don't. Maybe you can do something else. But if she said, no, I really want to do all this stuff, I would take that as a values violation. I, I couldn't have that in my relationship. I couldn't have that in my life, even though I would support her choice and disagree with it. 
I would very much disagree with it. I would tell her it's it's very unhealthy and it's uh, something that is going to affect your life maybe forever. And if she insisted that she wanted to do it and it would make her happy, I would say, okay, if that's your path, by all means, go on that path. But I can't be with you on this path. I can't take this path with you. I want to, but I can't. I can't watch you do this to yourself. I can't see someone I love do this. I I, I can't be a part of that. I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to tell you to stop. I'm going to tell you to reflect on this and hopefully change your mind, but I can't go with you. Can't do this with you. And she may not like that. She might say, you're supposed to love me unconditionally. And I'll say, I do my best. I really do. I, I want to. But I have my limits and I have my boundaries and I have my values. And I really thought we were going to agree on a lot of things together, but I can't agree with this. Yeah, that might mean breaking up. That might mean going our separate directions. That's also part of loving someone is supporting them going the direction they're going, even if it's not the same direction as you. And that's the hard part. That's probably the hardest thing I've talked about this whole episode because it is very difficult to let someone go and you see that as a way of loving them. You see that as a way of supporting them because it's uh, it's hurting you. It can be very hurtful to you. But sometimes you do what you have to do like that. You have to support someone in a way that doesn't give you what you want. But it's loving. It's supporting. It's showing them respect. It's showing them kindness. It's showing them that you still care about them very much, but you have limits too. And so hopefully that never happens to any of us, that somebody does something so uh, just way off the wall or very toxic to our own beliefs or values. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but when it does, we have to be sort of prepared to be okay to love them and let them go. That is an okay thing to do, in my opinion. I can love you from here as you go out into the world over there. But I can't join you in that, in that journey you're on because I can't agree with it. I can't get on board with it. And I, it doesn't mean I'm judging you. And I'm not trying to say if you leave, I'm leaving you. It's not a manipulation. It's not about trying to make them feel guilty. It's honoring you. It's not against them. It's for you. And so, again, that can be difficult. It can be difficult to do things for you knowing that other people will, may, well, they might be upset. They might leave. They might even not like you anymore. But to get to the point where you know yourself well, you understand what you value, you know what your boundaries are, which are what you will and won't accept in life. When you know yourself well enough to know what you want in your life, and what you don't want, that you are willing to stand up for yourself, honor yourself, go in the direction that might not be popular, might not be agreed upon, but when you're in that space, you show up as the full version of who you are. And that's what you show people. And the people that love you and support you want to be a part of that because they love seeing the full version of you. They don't want to have to interpret. They want to know what's on your mind. They may not want to know if they look good in this dress or <laughs> if their new haircut, haircut looks great, but they want to know the real you, at least as much as you can give them instead of hiding yourself from the world. Because when you hide yourself from the world, or at least a lot of yourself from the world, you don't get to experience the world at its fullest. You get to experience almost a shadow of what the world is. When I was showing up as the people pleaser and I was always trying to accommodate people like that, uh, I didn't get to see the real world because I never got real responses because I was never real. I was never authentic. When you show up authentically, you get, or you're more likely to get more authentic responses. And when people respond to you, when, when people talk to you, you are able to give them the real you. And they're able to determine who you are from that. 
And then you get to find out who your real friends, who your real lovers, who your real family, if I can say it that way, who your real people are. Who are my people? The people that accept me for who I am. All of me. It's just a philosophy. This is a philosophy episode. I hope it has made an impact on you. Thank you for allowing me to talk in your ear for the last uh, 50 minutes. <laughs> I'm so glad you joined me. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. We'll be right back with my thank yous and my goodbyes and my final words right after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank our patrons of the week, Fetsile, Chris, Wanda, Emily, Janet, Kayla. Oh, there's a name I can't pronounce. I'm going to try. Dilek. <laughs> it's good to have you on board. If I mispronounce that, let me know. Thank you for your support. Victoria, thank you as well. Everyone on the patron program, you are helping the show. You are keeping the lights on. Uh, it's a little exaggerated. I mean, it's on the internet. <laughs> I'm actually in a dark office right now doing this because it's nighttime and uh, it got dark while I was recording. So the lights can still come on thanks to you. I appreciate your patrons. Thank you so much. If you find value in the show like these people did and you want to give back, head over to moretob.com and you'll find options to do that over there. Thank you again, patrons. I am grateful. And for a show on how to deal with difficult relationships. I talked about difficult relationships a little bit today. Visit loveandabuse.com. That'll be helpful to you if you are dealing with anybody that is making you feel guilty, making you feel bad. Or if you are the person that's making someone feel guilty or bad or hurting them in some way. And you want to change that about yourself. Head over to healedbeing.com. And you'll find a very comprehensive program over there. A very successful program, too. I mean, you really do the work, you will change. You'll find the changes. Healedbeing.com. And finally, thanks to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. All right, for my final words, I'm just going to say a few things. I had a different idea for this episode. Like, uh, it started off thinking, hmm, do you believe in yourself? Do you want to feel good about yourself? Do you feel confident and courage. And I thought, well, I'm not a motivational show. Do I really want to talk about that? Believing in yourself? And then I thought, you know, I like to do the opposite. Okay. What happens if you don't believe in yourself? Hmm. Okay. If I don't believe in myself, uh, what does that mean? What does believing in oneself actually mean anyway? Is it to gain con uh, confidence or courage? Is it to gain something that um, gives me incentive to do something. I don't know. So I thought, I never said I believe in myself. <laughs> I never said in my life, I never said I believe in myself. Right now, I just, when I say that, it just sounds so new age. Yeah. And I'm not saying I have anything against new age. I'm just saying just some of the terms and the wording that we use, I believe in myself. I, maybe that works for some people. If it works for you, great. Always do what works. For me, I think I would never say that. I believe in myself. Now, I might say, I believe I can do it. But even that doesn't really feel congruent. I'm used to saying, I know I can do this. And then I'll try it and I'll fail. <laughs> and then I'll try it again and maybe I'll succeed. And then maybe I'll fail again. But um, anything that I do, I know I can do it. And then I just do it and then fail or succeed. I've learned that when I say, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then I do it. It's almost like I'm building a trust within myself. I'm building a sense of accomplishment or consistency. I think that's probably a better word. I'm building a sense of consistency in myself so that I know that when I start something, I'm going to follow through. I've had this belief that when we are consistently congruent in our own mind and we say, this is what I'm going to do, and then we do it, it's almost like we build a bond with ourselves, an unbreakable bond of integrity. Like we are communicating with another part of ourselves that is um, really relying on us to pull through. 
And this might be what happens when we don't pull through the believing in ourselves part. Like, why don't I believe in myself? Well, maybe it's because when I said I do it, I didn't do it. And I kept doing that behavior. I kept promising I would do it and not doing it, basically tricking myself for weeks or years. I said I was going to do it and I didn't do it. But I didn't tell anyone I was going to do it. I just talked to myself about it. No, I'm going to do it, and this is what I'm doing, and I'm doing it. And so I I build a sense of congruency inside myself so as to feel good in myself. I think that's what it comes down to. I will say that I'm going to do something, and I do it, whether I fail or not. At least I'm consistent. At least I've built a trust in myself, for myself. And then I feel good in myself because I know I'll follow through. Now, if I know I'm not going to follow through, I'm going to say that too. (laughs) I'm actually going to go on the other side of this and say, okay, you know, I'm going to work out every day. I'm going to do push-ups or sit-ups every day. And then I'll have a conversation with myself and I'll ask, are you really going to do that? (laughs) Are you really going to do that? What time are you going to get up and do that? Oh, you're going to do it at night when you're really tired. Is that, is that the truth? (laughs) So I will talk to myself and figure this stuff out and then I'll, Find out another way I can get exercise. What other way can you get exercise that you'll enjoy? And I realized, wait, I used to use uh, this weight set when I was younger. And I loved it. I loved using it because it, it had a function and they were comfortable. I mean, not I didn't feel comfortable burning and breaking muscle fiber, but <laughs> it is what I loved doing. And I decided to get that weight set again. And... um now it's sitting in a box. I mean, it just arrived. <laughs> so give me a break. I know I'm waiting for the other part of the weight set so I can actually put the dumbbells on it. But once it's here, I know I'll be using it daily. Now, will I? Well, that's the thing. Here I am feeling as I say it. Okay, I'm going to do this daily. Yeah, I'm going to do it daily because you know what? I'm going to put it in my office <laughs> and I'm going to have no choice. Even if I have to lift it three times. If I take the dumbbells and I lift them three times, I'm going to do it. They're right there. I can't escape them. I was going to put them in the basement and I realized I'm never going to go in the basement to work out. Never. Just going down to the basement now is a chore. (laughs) I mean, it's not hard, but you know, it's, I'm lazy. I, I don't want to do that. So if it's right there, it'll always be in my face. So I've decided this is what I'm going to do. Maybe it's my new year's resolution Uh, I didn't even think about it this way. I don't really make resolutions, but maybe that's what it is. Maybe I'll just make that an excuse. Hey, this is my New Year's Year's resolution. I'm going to do this. It's going to be in my face. And I spent some money on it, so now I better use it. But my point is, I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to be congruent. When I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. I don't have to tell anybody about it. I just have to do it. I just have to make myself accountable to myself. And, uh, then as a reward for working out, I have some ice cream. <laughs> anyway, if you're listening to this as it comes out, uh, I hope you have a great new year coming up to 2000, 2023. 2023, wow. But I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you're going to continue showing up in your life. I hope you are showing up in your life because that's what makes life amazing. That's how you experience life to the fullest is showing up as the fullest person you can be the most authentic the most connected to yourself and if you don't feel connected to yourself all i ask is that you keep an open mind so that you can step into your power because that's how you create the life you want always take steps to grow and evolve you are powerful beyond measure and above all And this is something I absolutely know to be true about you. You are amazing.